Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Kusro and Ishirawan Part 4, Trolling Justinian by Extra History. So, last time in our series on Kusro, we saw how he revitalized and reformed education, tax collection, military affairs, and religion within the Sassanid Empire. A truly impressive group of reforms that would carry on throughout and beyond his lifetime. But, we ended last episode by seeing some growing tension between the Romans and the Sassanids. Even though they were technically at peace, it seems like things are brewing beneath the surface. And judging by the title of this video, Trolling Justinian, I presume this episode is going to be focused on that tension between the two empires, and on particular, Kusro and Justinian. You know, I've said many times throughout this series, I think these are two very similar figures. Two very ambitious rulers of their respective empires who really tried to revitalize their empires fairly successfully, at least in the short term. There's a lot of parallels between the two, not to mention that both feature heavily in the story of the other. I mean, you can't talk about Kusro without talking about Justinian, and vice versa is also true. So I'm excited to get into more of Justinian in this episode. I think it's going to be an interesting one. If you guys end up enjoying this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships, through which you can get access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. The truce signed by Khosro and Justinian in 532 CE had no expiration date. <laughs> yes, a so-called Treaty of Eternal Peace. And while I do appreciate the optimism of eternal peace, I'm not sure a treaty of eternal peace has ever lasted eternally. Maybe there are some examples of these treaties that have lasted up until the present day. I'm not sure. But at least all examples of truces or treaties of eternal peace that I've heard of have eventually ended. <laughs> this peace was meant to last forever. Yeah. But after that nonsense the Romans had pulled with that barbarian adoption proposal... Yes, so if you guys remember, basically Kusro was supposed to be adopted as a son of the Roman Emperor. Not in a way that we would imagine it. He wasn't actually going to act as his son, but it was just a big honor to offer someone, you know, the ceremony of adoption. But the Romans didn't quite want to give a Persian that honor. They didn't feel like they were on an equal playing field, and so they offered Kusro basically an honor that was one step below. The Persians and Khosrow were extremely offended, they rejected it, and it was kind of cut off there. And that was definitely a contributing factor to the growing tension between the Romans and the Sassanids. Khosrow knew better than to trust them. Justinian had been meddling in his affairs, and Khosrow had proof. His loyal Arabic ally to the south had sent Khosrow a copy of a letter he'd received from Justinian, promising him gold hmm. if he would switch to Justinian's side. And I mean, this is not really surprising. You have the Sassanid Empire and the Roman Empire, these two massively powerful empires right next to each other, who are, and have been for a while, rivals. They both kind of want to get an advantage over the other one, even if they're technically at peace. And also, this is Justinian we're talking about. He was incredibly ambitious. He always had an eye on expanding the power of the Roman Empire. We can definitely see that in the West with his attempts to conquer and retake the former Western Roman provinces. But he was also ambitious in every aspect of Roman life, including, I would assume, in the East. Then, a group of Turks had arrived in Khosrow's court, with another letter that they claimed Justinian had sent, telling them that Rome would be grateful if they invaded Iran and created <laughs> some havoc. Khosrow sent copies of these letters back to Justinian and warned him that if this behavior continued, their treaty was over. But Justinian denied everything. Hey, K-Man, these letters aren't real. Chill out. And this is a good example of how Justinian would behave. Uh, he was a very ambitious guy. Oftentimes, I think he was overly ambitious. I think Justinian's a complicated figure. You could debate how much you like him, how effective he was. I'm kind of cynical slash skeptical on Justinian. I think he had a tendency to overextend. He was overly ambitious. 
And I imagine we might see the consequences of that in this video. You know, he would go a little too far, stretch his resources, stretch his manpower too far, and wouldn't be ready for the consequences of his actions. Though, if we're talking about, you know, Justinian's actions on a large scale, particularly, say, his conquests of the Western Roman provinces, I think a lot of the consequences would come much later, as in after Justinian was already gone. Yet the hits kept on coming. Envoys from the Visigoths stumbled into Cosro's court, begging for help against Romans who had been beating them up over in Italy. They said, And that's pretty remarkable. This is where we ended last time. We have this conflict going on between the Visigoths and the Romans in Italy, <laughs> and these guys have made it all the way back to Persia, to Iran, in order to plead with Cosro to help them. That is quite an amount of distance that has been covered. But it really does show you, even though I think the Europe uh, and the ancient world, I should say, as a whole of this era is becoming less interconnected than it was under the United Roman Empire, we can see there are still a lot of connections uh, in this time period over very large stretches of territory. I mean, we've seen examples of that with, you know, the Silk Road, the connections from China to India to Persia to Rome and then to the rest of Europe. So it is interesting to see this stuff. Do you really think that a man as greedy and ambitious as Justinian won't try to conquer your country as soon as he's done conquering ours? They Fair. urged Cosro to strike right now while the Romans are still tied down in the West. <laughs> I mean, look, he is making a fair point, though. Justinian was ambitious. I don't think he was stupid. I don't think Justinian would just attempt to fully conquer the Sassanids. That would be kind of crazy. But you could imagine Justinian going to war with the Persians, trying to take some of their territory being a problem. So I do think that's a, a fairly good argument to make. Like, look, he's tied down fighting us in the West. This is your opportunity to try and beat Justinian down because you know he's going to be a problem for you in the future. He's already working behind your back. When he's done with us, he's going to turn his full attention to you. It makes sense. News of Justinian's abuses also trickled in from Lesser Armenia, where the Romans had begun demanding taxes so high that the Armenians rose in revolt. The first Roman general sent to quell them tried to turn them against each other, only to screw it up and get killed in the first major battle. The Ooh. second Roman general lured the Armenians into a parley before treacherously killing their ambassador. The Damn. Armenians fled to Cosro's court and begged him to help. Peace treaty or no, this had gotten out of hand. Cosro asked a Zoroastrian fire temple to check the auspices for him, see if God would support him making war on the Romans. Yeah, though, I mean, you can frame this in a couple of different ways. You could frame what Cosro is doing as some sort of righteous action taken to protect the peoples of the region. I would be extraordinarily skeptical of that framing, I think that, you know, Castro is looking out for his empire. You know, he has that in mind, and taking the Romans down a peg is beneficial for the Persians. And so, all of these different abuses that Justinian is committing, you know, maybe Castro is genuinely upset, but at the end of the day, he's not going to get involved because of his bleeding heart. Oh, he feels so bad. No, these are just justifications that allow him to go after Justinian. At least that's how I would view it, and... I'd always be skeptical of people framing history in a way that emphasizes these kind of things. Or at least just think for yourself. <laughs> you know, use the interpretation that seems most accurate to you. Don't just take things at face value all the time. The Fire Temple said, yep. Which is no surprise. Historically, God generally tends to agree with kings, at least when they ask their priests nicely. I and wonder that was why. Good because with <laughs> this, Cosro could assure his courts that he wasn't breaking a treaty. Mm -mm, no, he. Not to mention that, uh, you know, they're making the point God seems to agree with kings, especially when they ask priests nicely. It's kind of a funny thing to say. Obviously, there's some truth to that, but also you got to remember, Cosro had already done so much for the Zoroastrian religion. Uh, and by the way, that was the religion of Iran before Islam, um, Zoroastrianism. Khosro had tried to rewrite down a bunch of scripture, holy books that had been lost. He had done a lot for the religion. So you can imagine he was probably quite favored by Zoroastrian priests 
uh, and those who were, you know, intense followers of the religion, pious. He was leading a holy war. See, throughout this entire period of peace, Cosro had been getting ready for this. After that adoption insult and the wrench Justinian threw into his succession, are you kidding me? Cosro was primed for revenge. But he wasn't just gonna beat Justinian. Oh, no, no, no. He was going to humiliate Justinian. Okay. And have himself a good old time doing it. Cosro swept into Roman territory at the head of a giant army, signaling that the eternal peace had officially expired. All right. I'm excited to see how this goes. Um, I know a bit about Justinian. I know Extra History has a series on Justinian, so maybe I'll watch that someday. But we have done the Epic History TV series on Belisarius, you know, Justinian's, frankly, partner in everything he did and his greatest general. And through learning about Belisarius, we learned a bit about Justinian together, Though, like I said, I would be interested on doing some Justinian-specific content in the future. Eternity, it turns out, is really just about eight years long. But he had <laughs> yeah. to move quickly because Justinian's army would not be stuck out in Italy forever. And fighting an army is way less fun than sacking an undefended countryside. So hmm. rather than taking the time to lay siege to every single town he came across, Cosro gave them a simple choice. Just surrender and pay me a bribe, or I will kill every single one of you. Yep, this is a common strategy uh, here being used by Khosrow, but used by many kingdoms, empires, tribes throughout history. You know, we see a lot of nomadic peoples using this. Um, you know, I'm a little familiar with the history of the Byzantine Empire, and this is the proposition offered to a lot of these frontier towns by different nomadic tribes that were raiding into Roman territory. Look, just pay up, give us a certain amount of money or tribute, and we'll leave your city alone. But if you don't pay us, then we're going to kill all of you. We're going to besiege your city, and it is going to be a horrific time for your people. And so, of course, a lot of cities would just rather pay up. <laughs> it's in their best interest. They're much more incentivized to just pay a certain amount of money and be left in peace instead of attempting to resist when, particularly in this case, there's no chance they can resist the armies of Kusro and then being slaughtered. One town chose to resist. After uh. that, the other towns did not. Yep. Kusro took that city bribe money and then used it to bribe Justinian's army. The soldiers appointed to the east had been complaining for years about how underpaid they were. Yep, and this is also another common theme. Uh, Rome, like... The Persian Empire was a very large empire territory-wise. Its frontiers were often sparsely defended, and the government often didn't send enough resources to the frontier regions. And so there were specific troops who defended the Roman frontier. They were kind of part-timers. They would work on their farms, go out to defend Rome's territories, Rome's borders, but they were always complaining that they weren't paid enough, they weren't sent enough resources, they weren't sent enough manpower. These were pretty common complaints. And if that goes on for long enough, then your loyalty to the central government, to the emperor, might start to decline because what's he ever done for you? And then Khosrow arrives, the Sassanids arrive, and sure, they are a rival of the Roman Empire, but they're also very impressive in their own right. They're a great civilization. And Kusro offers you some resources, some money, to desert or join up with him. I mean, what are you going to do, right? And now here was the Shah of Iran offering them money and glory by the handful. Roman deserters poured into Kusro's army. Yep. This lightning campaign through eastern Rome had one goal in sight. Antioch, the wealthiest mm. and largest of Justinian's cities in the east. Ever since an earthquake struck just a few years prior, Justinian had poured vast amounts of gold into rebuilding and restoring its former glory. So yeah, I don't know too much about uh, the history of this region. It's very vague. I mean, you could get far more detailed. But what I do know is that Antioch is an extremely important city, and it has been an important city for a while. Um, before Christianity, but also with Christianity, it's become a super important center of the region. Of course, Constantinople is by far the most important city in the Byzantine Empire at this point, but Antioch is also an incredibly important city. 
So naturally, when Cosro swept into the city and they refused to pay his bribe, he knocked down every single building, except Jesus. for the church, enslaved the inhabitants, and went on his way. Wow. Justinian was reeling, and now the quick capture of Antioch had him on the ropes. The Western troops he'd been counting on had been delayed by a stubborn general pursuing personal glory over in Rome, with no army. Uh, I would disagree with that framing, frankly. <laughs> I would completely disagree with that framing. Um, I, I think they're presenting it from Justinian's perspective. So that's probably how Justinian saw it. But, you know, we watched that entire series on Belisarius. And to say that he was pursuing personal glory over loyalty to, to Justinian or loyalty to the Roman Empire, I think that would be very misguided. <laughs> army coming to his aid and cities falling left and right, Justinian did the only thing he could. He sent envoys to beg for peace. The envoys told Cosro that breaking their treaty was kind of a jerk move. What hmm. had Rome ever done to deserve such treachery? Cosro showed them the letters Justinian had sent to his allies trying to turn them against him. And the envoys were like, all right, yeah. Yeah, big empires love to do this stuff. There are many examples of this. I think of, say... Uh, the Mexican-American War, where the United States had constant provocations against Mexico and the Mexican government, you know, constant patrols along the border, a bunch of abuses, and then when the war eventually started, the United States said, well, we have to defend ourselves. I mean, what have we ever done to Mexico <laughs> after all of those provocations? You know, uh, big empire syndrome, this is what Justinian's doing. He did all of those little provocations trying to get an advantage over Kusro. And now he's saying, what did we ever do to you? And Kusro goes, well, you know, I've got a list. You want me to read it? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Look, how about we give you a whole bunch of money plus a nice big yearly tribute if you will just knock it off and go away. Kusro agreed and sent... And this is Byzantine diplomacy. Um true at this moment and it will remain true throughout their history byzantine diplomacy mainly consists of giving people money you know the byzantine empire the eastern roman empire is a big wealthy and powerful empire but it is in terminal decline um, it will be in terminal decline for about a thousand years <laughs> which to be fair is an impressive amount of time to be in decline even able to survive for that long the Byzantine Empire cannot marshal enough resources to fight all the battles it needs to fight. It doesn't have enough manpower, definitely. It doesn't have the ability to mobilize that amount of resources or manpower. And so you will see throughout Byzantine history, they have a tendency of just paying their enemies off. Paying people money, giving them land, in order to just either put problems off or ideally to solve problems. So... You know, this is basically quintessential Byzantine diplomacy, and this is still relatively early in the existence of the Byzantine Empire. I mean, the Byzantine Empire is just a continuation of the Roman Empire, which has already been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. But of course, the fall of the West was not that long before this point. Uh, and the Byzantines certainly have differences from the United Roman Empire, so, if you view it that way, we're fairly early into sort of the Byzantine era, but we're already seeing this sort of money-laden Byzantine diplomacy that will continue through the collapse of Constantinople. Sent them running back to Justinian. Now, the Romans believed that this new treaty began the moment Cosro said yes, but it turns out, no. As far as Cosro was concerned, the treaty wasn't official until the Romans paid up. And Jeez. until that happened, he was going to turn his campaign up to 11. Now, instead of capturing Roman cities, Cosro began turning them into his own private resorts. <laughs> he marched all the way to the Mediterranean Sea just so he could swim in its waters like the great shahs of Iran's ancient past, sending yep. Justinian a reminder of just how far Cosro had come and how little Justinian could do to stop him. It's my understanding that that was always kind of a big deal for the Persians or other conquerors coming from the east to be able to, you know, sunbathe on the beaches of the Mediterranean, feel the ocean itself. Uh, it was kind of a big deal. 
considering, I guess, that the Romans had dominated the Mediterranean world for a while now. It was kind of seen as their territory, and so being able to do that was impressive. Then, Cosro took over a town and paid them to stage a special day of chariot races, just for him. And he happened to know that Justinian was a mega fan of the blue racing faction. So Cosro fixed the races <laughs> to make sure that the blues suffered an embarrassing loss to the rival greens. Okay, so first off, he's getting a little petty at this point. <laughs> Seems like Cosro is really trying to rub it in. Uh, I'm not sure how necessary this is, but... You know, we're talking about these ancient chariot races, the two teams. They were actually more than two teams, but the blues and the greens. This is a really fascinating thing to study. They were sports teams, but particularly in Constantinople, they also served a lot of different purposes. They were political factions and basically gangs slash mobs. They would do a lot of political activity, <laughs> and by that I mean a lot of intimidation, beating, bribing, that kind of stuff, um, particularly in this era. So if you're researching this era of Roman history, uh, I think a really fascinating topic would be the role of these sports teams, these uh, chariot racing teams, the blues and the greens, in Roman life and Roman politics, like I said, particularly in Constantinople. He went on like this from town to town, demanding tribute from everybody and making Justinian look like a fool. He hmm. even took another swing at trying to capture Dara, that old sore spot between Iran and Rome, yep. although once again Dara survived the attack. Then, finally, Justinian's stubborn general returned from the west with his main army, and Justinian was like, okay, screw your treaty, we are doing this. Now Belisarius is getting sent. You know, I've got a lot of praise for Belisarius. He wasn't a perfect guy, no one is, but... He is very talented. Now, Cosro still had all the people he'd enslaved back at Antioch, and he'd kind of been counting on this treaty as an opportunity to sell them back to Justinian. But now he was stuck with them. <laughs> After giving it... Yeah, maybe... I mean, he clearly wanted to sort of rub it in on the Romans, show them who was boss, but maybe he should have taken a bit of a step back? I don't know. Um, I mean, look, Cosro has a lot of power... Uh, a lot of manpower in terms of his military, so he can certainly put up an impressive match against Belisarius and the Romans. Some thought, he decided that he would take them back to Iran and build them a new town. Resettling captives from defeated cities was an old Iranian tradition. It was a great way to add a bunch of talented craftsmen to your population. Many shows yeah. before Khosro had done exactly that. But our Khosro, he liked to go above and beyond. Hmm. He named his new city Way Antioch Khosro. Which trans yeah, I've heard of this. Relates to Cosro's better <laughs> Antioch. So he petty, so petty. Created that city down to the smallest detail, from the layout of the streets to the number of rooms in each house. Even the building materials were the same. Then and look, I mean, Justinian was pretty petty. He also had quite the ego. I imagine it's hard to get up to the position of uh, emperor of the Romans or Shah without having quite the ego and being petty in some ways. And Cosro freed the captive Antiochians and sent them to live in their new city. Okay, uh, I, I do think, I like how extra history presents history. I think it's very easily consumable, um, easily understandable. I do think they put a bit of a glossy sheen over it sometimes, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you know, it's <laughs> these are literally people who you've captured, enslaved, and forced to move somewhere else. Uh, it's nice that you've given them a shiny new city and that they're now freed. <laughs> but it's, you know, if you think about it, still not a good thing to capture people and forcefully move them somewhere, right? So I want us to just keep that in mind because this is being framed as uh, a positive, shiny thing when in reality it's a lot dirtier and more negative. And that's often the case with history. And, you know, I just think we should try and keep that in mind. They were astounded. Cosro asked one random citizen if he was happy to see his house again. And the man replied, oh, yes, this looks exactly like it. Although I do miss that mulberry tree that used to be in my front yard. The next morning, the man woke up to find a mulberry tree planted in his front yard. Cosro oh. <laughs> I thought they were going to say a full mulberry tree. Or was it a foot? Did they just rip it out of the ground somewhere and put it somewhere else? I don't know. 
P- probably not. Um, yeah. S- some of this is definitely propaganda on behalf of Kusro. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. So, also take things you hear with a grain of salt, specifically uh, if you don't know the source from which it's coming. Kusro's message to Justinian was clear. Your soldiers choose me, your towns choose me, and your people choose me. Get wrecked, son! Justinian now had his army back, but Kosro still had him outnumbered. For a while, the Romans attempted small raiding expeditions. You know, I gotta say, watching this episode, seeing a little bit more of how Kosro behaves, particularly against the Romans, I'm now more convinced than ever that Kusro and Justinian are very, very similar. <laughs> similar in many ways. ...staying very, very far away from any direct confrontation. That wouldn't do. Kosro gathered his army and marched on Jerusalem, prepared to take the battle directly to Justinian's face. Wow. But what? Yeah, he is targeting cities that are specifically important for Rome and specifically important for Christianity. So... Some good targets. Antioch, Jerusalem. While he was still marching to Antioch, a dark shadow crept into his army. Kosro's men began to burst out oh, in boils. No. Their skin decayed. They began to vomit blood. A plague from the land of Egypt had stretched out its hand and brushed both armies with decrepit fingers. The Romans shrank back into their cities. Kosro and his army retreated north, looking for sanctuary, but the disease had already swept through his ranks. Uh -oh. And worse, it had even closed its grip around Kosro himself. Uh, is he gonna die from the plague? My goodness. Uh, I'm, I guess we might see some of the plague next episode. A plague that I don't know how it affected the Sassanid Empire, but I do know that it devastated the Romans. Now, the Roman Empire, like I said, would be in terminal decline for a thousand years after this, but... It would have a difficult period after Justinian died. I think part of that is due to Justinian overextending, using too many of his resources, trying to hold territory he couldn't hold, but a lot of that difficulty, um, I don't know how much of it, but a lot of it is due to the plague that would come and devastate the entire region, devastate the Roman Empire. Uh, I'm often, I think, a little too critical on Justinian. We talked about this in our series on Belisarius because I, I do think he made a lot of mistakes and I do think he, you know, really wasn't thinking long-term, at least not realistically. But the plague did a massive amount of damage that really no emperor could have contained. Uh, and I'm curious to see how this will affect Kostro and the Persians. Um, so yeah. I enjoyed this episode. Um, you know, I had a couple comments on how they presented things. I think that's all right. Uh, that's why I do these reaction videos, to give my own opinion, add details and information where I can, right? So yeah, this was a good one. If you guys enjoyed it, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon and channel memberships. You can find the Patreon linked down below, channel memberships. You can access by hitting the join button next to the subscribe button. And if you subscribe to either the Patreon or channel memberships, you will get access to exclusive reactions. Um, so that's a pretty good deal, I think. Anyway, with uh, all of that said and done, I hope you guys are all having a good day today. And I will see you again next time. Goodbye.